Welcome. All right. I think for today, I'm going to be playing some Shadow Dark. Um, I'm going to be, be I'm going to begin with the very next uh, adventure I have set within my region that I um, fully created within the core rulebook for Shadow Dark, the Perilous Badlands, um, mapped by the fictional Veraline cartographer, and we have yet to know anything about this particular person on how they map this or if it's accurate. Um, but we have decided to start our next adventure in within this little sandy region um, known as the Flaming Sands um, of in within um, Hex 93 in the town of Vorn. Um, I hope this comes up a little bit better than what I see here, but the Flaming Sands is the entire island region up until the Forsaken Dunes out uh, in the periphery that um, I have established that is basically impenetrable. Um, one thing of note, when I had created all of these um, hexes, I, I denoted the safety of each hex when I created them, so I don't have to roll for how safe they are. And oddly enough, um, the town itself of Vorn is a chaotic town um, and is unsafe. And also the hex it's on is also unsafe. So for, as per the rules, for every um, unsafe, uh, um, unsafe hexes, we roll for encounters every um, uh, three hours, um, or within the Shadow Dark regions of dungeons and underground exploration, or just uh, locations that are danger, you know, a danger to explore, like desert ruins and stuff like that, will be every three rounds. Um, so unsafe is technically the um, the safest of all of the um, um, uh, the random encounter you know, frequencies, but, um, needless to say, I'm going to try to remember to keep rolling for those. I'm going to use this die for the D6 rolls. Um, I am aware that these, these dice don't have great visibility. I just like rolling them. Um, I got this one. I love the design on this one a lot. And for me, this pops, it's really nice. Um, so, I'm going to be using these dice for my respective characters and their damage dice. And if we need a D100 roll, I'll be using these. Um, as a recap, really quick, I had gone over in the previous episode uh, the characters that I'm going to be playing with and where we're going to be starting the adventure. Um, but just to bring people back up to speed, I, have a, I rolled up a wizard uh, by the name of Tamra. Um, she is a shaman and uh, has the protection from evil, detect magic, and sleep spells available to her currently. And I rolled up a pit fighter, um, an underdog by the name of Morgan. Um, and he, um, a a a along with his trusty longsword, keeps at on his belt a blowgun. Um that he wants to utilize, hopefully for other effects, as opposed to just doing a single point of damage. But doing a single point of damage uh, guaranteed when hit is kind of nice for certain circumstances. Um, both of them have fairly um, mediocre um, hit points to start. Um, 
but we'll see if it comes into play. Morgan is has an AC of 15 though, so that's pretty nice. Um, but let's get into what I want to start now is kind of to set the tone of where our characters are. It is dusty. It is hot. It is a lawless town. Not so lawless as in everything is bad all the time. But people are out for themselves. And if you cannot help them, they won't help you. The town of Vorn is a smallish village on the outskirts of what is known as the Forsaken Dunes. Just south and east of the town is a massive old structure that no one knows um, what it was at some point, but it had been completely covered in sand for for so long. It's been eroded and smoothed and crumbled down. And I actually had drawn this rectangular box to denote how big this structure is. It is so big that the people of the slums on the western side of the town live in its shadow some days. So, or some portion of the day. And um, we have a few, we have a few sort of um, interesting locations that I want to go over just to again set the tone. There's a harbor, a very small harbor in uh, this, I don't know where it is, but to go north from here, uh, there is a harbor somewhere within these tiles. Haven't figured that out yet, but the, the, the path northward goes to that harbor. The path south out of the village. Oh no, <laughs> just realized. Um, the path south leads deep within, deep into the Forsaken Dunes and into places unknown and you know, places very dangerous. And no one who has left um, intending to travel further south has ever returned. People have assumed that it is due to the hot sands and the extreme temperatures and the volatile nature in which the flaming sands and the forbidden and the forsaken dunes consume all who travel there. So going south, even though it is a lawless land, most people uh, try to per persuade people not to do that. The sands of flame or the flaming sands consume most of the village. And the standing, uh, t the standing um, dwellings have been built upon older dwellings that have been consumed by sand. So there is a, an under, there's kind of like an under um, dark, if you will, of, of buildings and such that are underneath the village itself. The village is fairly old, but not old enough that no one can't remember an interesting time or an interesting story about the sands not consuming a particular uh, business. There might be an old woman on the corner talking about several decades ago, there was a tailor underneath a building that is now tenements, stuff like that. There is a money lender in town who kind of houses a, cri a criminal safe house in the north of the village. Have not, um, uh, f you know, fleshed out anything about that particular location. But um, the fact there is a money, money lender uh, aiding in those criminals that might be borrowing money to do said activities speaks volumes on the type of things and the, and the tone of the village. The flop house is quite seedy and is quite uh, low, low budget 
Um, it's called the Boot and Hearth. It is the first sort of main building that you see when you come into the town from the harbor, if you make it through the sands. And it is free to stay, but there is no security. There is no guarantee. And honestly, there is no one watching your back. But it is a place to crash and to sleep if you can protect your own. There is a rumored witch's hovel somewhere within the slums as well, but no one has been able to locate it. There has been a, an uptick in you know, uh, curses and an uptick in um, uh, activity that is supernatural in nature that people point to a witch or point to a sorceress. Um, who has been mind controlling people. And that is one little kind of underpinning um, that the people of the slums themselves don't trust each other, especially if they start acting different than they are thought to be. A shopkeep would say no business to someone who had been coming in for years if they start talking differently or if they start you know, sharing information that feels different than they normally would have before. So there's an air of distrust in the town as well. The tavern, the single tavern in the entire town, is the Demon's Goblet, um, run by an adolescent um, who is a little, uh, I believe we wrote down their traits and everything in, the, in my previous session. Uh, yes. Um, uh, uh, vain and muscular, moves slowly, probably with a limp or something like that, but um, definitely is someone that probably could hold their own, at least in a bar fight. Um, uh, being adolescent and, and young and like r running a the only tavern in town probably uh, has hardened the spirit of this young individual into something that is probably a little more resilient than a normal uh, adolescent um, human. There are a bunch of warehouses and sheds scattered throughout the low district um, run by the stout daughters of, of Peroden. I've not rolled up much about this particular thing. I envision that it is a a ring uh, business that is run by a family, most likely. And then there is a notable graveyard um, to the northeast of the Low District. Um, and the town hall and the village hall is <clears throat> just north of the Demon's Goblet. And again, everything is covered in a sandy grit dust. And every so often, there is a trade caravan that does come from the harbor, sets up camp, and then leaves afterward. So there's no permanent market. The shops around here are usually pop-ups. Um, and they come and go as the need arises. So that is sort of the, the feel of Vorn within this, the, the flaming sands. And we open up as Morgan and Tamra are <clears throat> having their morning ritual of fresh water from the only well in the center of town that seems to be the only thing that is a source of communal respect in the entire town. Since it's the only source of water, everyone treats it as their, their lifeline. And they will defend it from anyone who tries to tamper with it as well. So that is also something of note. But as Morgan and Tamara are sitting down and talking and having their morning ration, if you will. An old woman 
points at Morgan and Tamara and yells, there they are! And that's how we're going to start our new adventure here. Um, and everything up until this point has been kind of percolating over the past week or so for me. And so from this point onward, I am going to have no idea what's going to happen. So the inciting incident is an old woman points at them and yells, there they are. Why is this happening? Now, I could go to the book um, and roll on some NPC tables on um, uh, the... Um, where is the NPC stuff? Where is it? Random encounters, traps. Oh, wow. Come on. <clears throat> Random crawlers, NPC names. Um, the... Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. There was a table somewhere that had sort of, um, uh, like characteristics and, or something like that. But, um, because I can't find it quick enough, I'm going to use, because I have it open with me, um, my trusty Solo Game Master's Guide, and I'm going to use the Action and Theme Oracle, um, which uh, she took from Ironsworn and just put it in her book for us soloists to use. So I'm going to roll on these tables and see what the, what the, the impetus for pointing at our, our adventures are is right so let me roll a d100 and let's roll action and so this is her reasoning on why she's going to point at them so 79 is effect so to change something or to modify something so effect 40 effect uh opinion okay okay so let us write that down real quick. I want to make a note of that. So, effect, and then opinion. Okay, so I read that as an old woman who wants to change the opinion of the guard, the townsfolk, about Morgan and Tamara. Now, I believe this is going to directly relate to Morgan's background as a banished individual cast out for s supposed crimes so i believe this is exactly what this is so this is the moment that morgan is uh kind of ostracized and singled out as doing something now affect opinion isn't directly a crime to have an opinion on somebody or to talk, you know, talk crap about somebody to badmouth, you know, somebody. That happens all the time in this town. So pointing at someone and going, you know, they, they're they horrible people, probably isn't going to rise the guards. But yells, there they are. And they have, oh, yes. So I, I can read this and I can make this uh, make more sense. The old woman points to them and says, there they are. They're the ones who have soiled our good name. Aha, there we go. So pointing at Tamara and Morgan and basically pointing fingers at them, blaming them for the bad things that have been said. The wizard, Tamara, is painted as being a, a sympathizer to the, the underdog uh, pit fighter, Morgan, uh, for probably, uh, probably, um, what's the word, when you um, help somebody on someone else's team, I forget what that's called, when you collude. And so she is marked as well um, as helping this individual. Um, what they don't know is that, that both Morgan and Tamara, they are engaged. Um, and, of course, Tamara is going to protect her fiancé 
fiance, I, I don't know what it is, but they are betrothed to each other. So they're probably going to try to sway this woman to, you know, stop her her uh, thing. But what I do want to do, do is roll for Morgan because he was banished and using his background. I think he wants to, um, he was cast out for supposed crimes. So he's probably going to want to run. So I'm going to use that as his sort of fight or flight. And he's going to, I'm going to say that he's going to gain an advantage on a role pertaining to trying to get out of this situation because he knows that if any fingers are pointed at him, that that stuff is going to come back to him. And he knows, he has learned how to navigate social situations to kind of get out of those finger pointing situations. And so I'm going to say that even though he has a charisma of five, of negative three, <laughs> um, he is going to uh, roll with advantage to try to um, talk his way out. Um, and Tamra is there helping, but Tamra is not really doing the talking. It is Morgan stepping up and being being who he is, which is he's not a good talker, but he has a big stance and he's kind of a larger human and he is he is full of I wouldn't say pride, but he knows that what he did wasn't wrong. And I I kind of env envision we haven't really decided what the crime supposed uh you know crime was. But right now, it doesn't really matter. He's just trying to defend his his honor, so to speak, in the moment of being told, Aha! There they are! They did something bad! And he's saying, Old woman, we had nothing to do with it. So that's 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 a first sort of move and roll for the game. So I'm going to roll with advantage using his banished uh, you know, background trait to... See if he can't do anything. I'm going to set this DC as hard. So DC is 15, um, which effectively means that he needs a an 18 to succeed on one of these die, which is basically impossible for him. Ah, we got a 13 and a 10. So we got a 13 minus 3 is 10. So that is underneath that hard DC. I remembered to set the DC guys. <laughs> okay, so he fails. So it looks something like this. You know, he's talking, but he's fumbling, and obviously he's not very charismatic, and his presence is much more of one that is definitely meant for fighting. Um, and his shield at his side, you know, has seen scuffs, and the you know, leather armor is full of dust and marks and scrapes, He's not very well presented as someone who can talk his way out of things. And the old woman uh, says, Bah! Never mind the, 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 the foul words of a liar, right? You know, she points her finger and says, Guards! Guards! I found them! I found them! They're over here! And so I think what we're going to do here is we're going to have a sort of scene where they're trying to outrun and um dip dive dutch uh dip dip die dip no dodge dip dive duck and dodge <laughs> the five d's of dodgeball right <laughs> if ever, if anyone knows what i'm talking about <laughs> good on you so they're going to uh, weave in and out of the slums of vorn here you know they had just left the the demon's goblet, but they know they need to um, leave and find shelter somewhere. They do not have a proper home. They have been uh, staying at the flop house. The, um, the flop house by the name of... What did I name the flop house? Uh, Vorn, the flop house name is... Uh, the boot and hearth. So they've been staying at the boot and hearth, right? Um, 
they have most of their stuff, so they need to get to the boot and hearth, grab their other belongings, and then find another place to stay. So this is going to be a series of of um, of challenges using their skill sets. Um, and what I will say is that um, they're probably going to have to make a couple of group checks, either stealth, um, so dexterity checks, probably strength checks to try to uh, you jump around things, um, probably some intelligence checks to sort of uh, find different ways around buildings and stuff like that. Um, and obviously a few wisdom checks to to spot guards, you know, from afar and stuff like that. So what I want to do is I want to set a scene challenge of how many checks to make. So this is what I do sometimes, especially if there's not a direct um, skill needed. And I don't use a map for like, you know, uh, a traversal of the, the space. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the scene is um, escape from the guards, right? And I'm going to roll a d4, and this is how many successes that they will need. And I just picked the d4 because <laughs> um, on the top of my head, a d4 is how many successes uh, is possible. And then, you know, if it's a longer scene, I might use a D6 or D8 or whatever. I just, this is arbitrary. Um, my process is pretty off the cuff. So I'm just going to roll a D4. So then you need two successes to escape the guards. It doesn't seem like a lot, but so I'm going to mark two boxes and I'm going to say that the narrative is that they're leaving they, they are bolting from the outside uh, kind of loosely um, tabled uh, dust uh, you know, covered uh, space and the town's well is outside of the tavern, right? That makes sense. So they had just recently f you filled up their their you know, rations and everything, and they were just about to sit down and eat before the old woman came out of the tavern, probably, and pointed at them. And that's when the guards came around the corner, and they're about to leave. And so they know that they need to leave from the tavern, which is right about here. Uh, nope, that's, that's not. The taverns were right about there, midtown. So they're going to go into the slums proper. So they're kind of in the transition period between the low district and this and the uh, slums. So they're going to try to bolt. So that's speed. So that is dexterity. So the first the first roll is definitely going to be dex, and we'll see what happens narratively after that. So I'm going to roll for both of them. Um, I'm going to set the DC to this as normal, just because it's more about their own skill to just to run. And the guards aren't right next to them right now, or else I would say that's either hard or extreme. So this is just normal. Um, so the DC is 12. And so the I because I always read the darker dice first, um, I that is going to be my main character, which is Morgan, and my companion character, which is Tamara, which will be the um, white die here. So Morgan, this dex is two plus uh, four, so that's six. He fails. Uh, she has a dex of zero, 16, which is, which is a success on the normal. So we have one success and one failure. So that is, a, that is half, half there. But So how that looks as a group uh, kind of thing is that Tamara is finding ways around boxes and you know, finding ways, um, you know, through uh, the back alleys quickly and using her knowledge of the area, of course. And maybe because uh, Morgan was caught off guard and why he, he was being singled out all of a sudden. 
slowed his progress down. So he's a little behind Tamara. So I think Tamara is actually going to have to do something here. Um, there is, I believe, there is a stat for months for uh, so NPCs here. Um, and I believe uh, I want a basic sort of uh, guard um, uh, guard sort of thing here. And I'm trying to figure out if there is one. Um, really quick, let me just bring this up. Um, a guard <coughs> giant. Is there like a uh, like a human sort of like individual, right? You know, um, monster stats, monster generator. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. You know, one of these days, I think I am going to make a monster list. I know that uh, somebody had made a nice. Uh, kind of modifiable files for monsters. Um, but this time, what am I doing? There we go. Uh, I want to find a pretty good guard. Here we go. A sentry equipped with sturdy weapons and armor. Okay, so they are level one. Perfect. This is, I will use this. They are level one. So I think what Tamara is going to do is that she is going to sort of hurry up Morgan. Come here, come here, come here. I, you know, I found the next, you know, she found a small alcove to duck into. And Morgan's like huffing and puffing behind her. <sighs> okay, dives in. And then she goes, shush, wait here. And she's going to cast to sleep. So she's going to wait um, until the guards come into play. And she's going to cast sleep, which is a instant spell that within near, so like 30 or 40 feet, something like that, you weave a lulling spell that fills a near-sized cube extending from you. And living creatures in the area of effect fall into a deep sleep if they are level two or less and making sure that no vigorous shaking and being injured w wakes them. So that is what she's going to do. She's going to cast sleep on the guards as they approach. How many guards? Um, because this is a small town um, and I don't know how severe of a, how severe are these crimes? This is a, question that you would ask the GM or the GM would know, right? Well, I'm both GM and player, and I don't want to make it too easy or hard on myself, you know, because I want to. So I'm going to ask the Oracle, um, is this a major crime, like a major crime? And I'm going to say that it is unlikely that it is a major crime. So I'm going to roll on a ask the Oracle roll. Um, this is provided by, again, Ironsworn, um, Sean Tompkins. This is the updated Oracle role for um, Starforged. And I use this a lot for any as um, I'm asking of the Oracle role. Um, and so I'm going to ask it. And so 25 or less, it is a major crime. 11! Oh, no. And here's the thing. The wonderful thing about this thing is it adds things that might be different. So on a match, so if both these numbers are the same, which this is, a 1 and a 1, so 11, on a match, envision a complication or twist. So I asked the Oracle, is this a major crime? So it is. So we need to note um, so scene and the um, crime... Um, um, so the cr crime pinned on Morgan, right? Morgan is a major one, right? 
is a major crime. And so that's bad, right? Um, and what's the twist? So <clears throat> I could roll to see what kind of twist, and I kind of want to do that. Um, so I want to roll on... Th there's, again, in the Solo Game Master's Guide, there is a the twat a complication a twist to the uh to the thing right <coughs> um i also could um plot twists and here we go so you need something to shake up the action you can decide at the outset of a session that any time that you roll say doubles on the table which is what i you could also introduce a plot twist or you could decide that if you roll a d20 at the beginning of every scene. So there we go. So this is uh, this is from uh, um, this is from a table that she took from OSR uh, Solo Rules. Um, I've not used these rules myself, but I love the tables that she put into this book. So I'm gonna roll on this. So I'm gonna roll a two d6. I need a, another d6. All right, let's roll. Okay, so all of this, all of this is to decide the scale of this crime. And because it was a complication, I'm gonna see what this is. Um, again, six first, oh my God, double sixes. An item ends the scene. An item ends the scene. Okay, so, all right, so I'm just going to the crime is pinned is, is a major crime, but the twist of this whole thing is an item ends the scene. Okay, so we are not done with rolling to escape the guards. But the narrative and the, the plot devices that have been put by the dice tells me that an item is going to end the scene. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to continue on with the story. So she is going to cast sleep, right? So all of this is to say, well, all the dice rolls have been just to, to figure out what the crime was and how complicated it was. So the item has to relate to the crime or something related to that background right so she is about to cast sleep so she's going to have to do her um her her spell cast roll so she is she is a wizard and her her intelligence is 15 so she gets plus two um and she has no extra thing she has advantage on casting oh um shoot I did not choose this. When, as a wizard, I believe... Oh, wow. I came completely unprepared for her. I haven't built a wizard before in Shadow Dark, so I was unfamiliar on things. So let me just look at it again. You can cast wizards... But you know three each time you gain level for learning spells, languages. Um, because... I gain advantage on casting one spell you know. Well, so that is something that I did not not set up. Um, so she would have advantage on casting one of these spells. Huh. Player knowledge and character knowledge. This is so wild because... Oops. Sorry for bumping you. I would like to have advantage on casting the spell I'm about to cast, which is sleep, but I don't want any undo things. So I'm actually going to randomly roll. So I'm going to roll my D3 here. Uh, detect magic is one. Protection from evil is two. And sleep is three. So I'm just going to roll, and this will be the spell that she can roll with advantage. Of course, I roll it into... A space that I can't get into. So let me fix that again. Let me try that again. So again, detect magic is one, protection from evil is two, and sleep is three. So three, sleep. Wow. Well, there we go. The dice 
always tell the story, right? Okay, so I'm going to note that advantage on casting sleep. Okay, so she gets advantage on this roll, and she gets a plus two. So the DC for this is going to be her spell casting, which is 10 plus the tier. So 11. So she needs to get an 11 on this, but she gets, uh, she gets advantage. Wow. Okay. Well, you know, I think the dice are just going to, um, be, be like that to me. If anyone has been watching enough, know that dice, especially D20s, don't particularly like rolling high for me. And this is a game that likes to, uh, reinforce on how hard and brutal it can be all right so she fails so she as per the rules cannot cast this spell again until she rests thankfully it was not a critical failure um personally as a player i would love to have a character critically fail on a spell table i would love to roll to see what happens i love that stuff so i'm gonna read that as this she casts sleep and it fizzles because maybe she was trying to cast it, bef uh, but she was waiting too long, and she was mid-cast, and uh, because of the Morgan failed to get into the alcove in time, she had to hesitate, and the action of the guards coming up. And I think we're going to have to enter into an actual combat. So I'm going. So she fails casting. Um, sleep. And now I need to roll initiative, per se. And so I think, narratively, um, it would be the guard's turn to do stuff. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have um, this be the guards and this be Tamra. And... I don't really have a good thing right in front of me, so I'll use, even though it's not, I'll use this as um, Morgan. So the guards are gonna go, guards are, are gonna go first, and they come up, and they see um, Tamra and um, uh, Morgan there. And I'm gonna roll a D3, this is a major crime. In fact, you know what? Major crime. How many guards? How many? Um, how many things? How many things? I wish that I had a really good solo table for rolling for how many. Like, is it a lot? Is it many? Is it a few? Some tables have like, um, uh, um, like how many of it? of a of a monster that there are but um this is a little bit different narratively narratively um i'm just trying to get to the guard uh stat block in the game in the book which is page page 224 224 okay so they oh they're kind of hard to hit too all right. Well, they only have four hit points. Their attack is a D6. Okay, so I think they're going to use spears. Um, spears are pretty good for, you know, dealing with little vermin that are around the town. Um, the little stingers and stuff like that from the, uh, from the you know, the various sand crawlers and stuff. Um, so they have, a, they have a shield and a spear. Um... So they're going to attack, but how many of them are, are coming up? And I think only a couple can attack because both Tamara and uh, Morgan are in this kind of alcove space. I envision them in a small um, sort of alleyway that they've ducked into um, an alcove. Now, I haven't really rolled to see what this alcove is, if there might be a way out underneath it. I don't know. We'll see. We'll get there. But right now, the guards are going to attack probably um, Morgan first because Morgan is probably at at the most, um, is actually closer to, to them. So let us roll. 
how many guards are killing them. I'm going to roll a d6. That sounds about right. So there are four guards. So I'm just going to... Um, so the guards... Uh, so guards... Now you get to see how I write quick notes. Guards. One, two, three, four. And each of them have uh, HP four. So I'm probably going to just do X's, right? For the total XP on each of them. If it comes to that, it probably won't. So his, his you know, reflexes know that combat's about to happen. So... Tamra, it went, you know, kind of, you, you know, says, watch out! And then Morgan turns around and sees a guard about to swipe at him. And so the, he is going to roll. Um, no, hold on. The damage applies automatically, correct? I can't remember. I can't remember... It's been a bit. I know I did combat before. Um, and I'm just going to be unpredictable. Well, that is solo gameplay in of itself. Unpredictable because we don't even know. Telegraphing danger. I don't think we can do that. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the stats, blah, blah, blah. Making checks. Dice. Um... Adventuring, no, 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 no. We want, we want um, damage, right? Um, doo -doo -doo. Initiative, yep. Player, GM, um, random encounter makes moves some relevant creatures. Describes what happens and notice results. Yep. Um, movement, actions, encounters. Yep. Danger, hide, and detecting, surprise, combat, yep. Characters can take one action and move, yep, yep, yep. When you hit, uh, morale, enemies, yep. Death, st stabilizing, yep. Strength modifier, yep. Um, monsters... Okay, base attacks. Yep, got it. Okay, so the guard one, two. I, I really should remember to write the it's two twenty four. There we go. So stat is plus one on this roll. I really should get a different dice for the monsters because I don't want. Um, here we go. I'll use the this white one four. So two of them are going to attack uh, Morgan here. Uh, eight plus one is nine. Does not meet Morgan's fifteen. So his shield comes up and clang, and the next one comes in. Uh, natural twenty. So a guard is going to, um, I think, natural twenty on a normal hit. Um, I just like to know. I've done. I know that the natural twenties on a spell is double the numeric value or increase the numeric value. Um, so uh, critical damage. You deal critical hit if you roll, yep, yep, yep. For, for a weapon, double its damage dice on the attack. So um, the spear is a d6, so we're going to do 2d6. 2d6 damage onto um, Morgan. Ooh, 10 damage. Clang! So, here's the thing. Um, we're going to do a... These are... Alignment is lawful. So, here's the thing. This, these guards are in a chaotic space. They are chaotic beings, I'm going to say, because they live in and they work in this space. So... They are attacking, but they do 11 points of damage, um, or 10 points of damage. So he is damaged. I'm just going to write 10. That sucks. He's down to one. Oh, massive hit. And this space, um, Morgan is going to turn around 
and he is going to attempt to make a swap um, uh, on hit advantage on con to resist con check. Right? Yep. 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 Day. Oh, reduced to zero. Go to one hit point. Okay, so he can he can come back up, and that's the whole point. Get up from uh, dying. Got it. Okay, so he hasn't died yet. He's he's at one hit point. So beaten in a you know bloody, he goes. Tamra, run! And I, I don't know. I don't think Tamra is going to run. He's going. She she's going to stay with him. Um, is there and is there like a crawl space underneath this alcove to go it into or underneath the sand of this building? Um, it, I'm going to say fifty fifty because I don't really know. Um, so fifty or less, uh, six. So yes, there is. So there is a way to crawl. He goes. And so Tamara goes, ah, there's a way out. There's a way out. Follow me. And so Tamara starts crawling. Um, and is Morgan going to fight and, and wait? You know what? He's probably going to... I'm, I'm going to not do that. I'm going to have him crawl through. And because now the narrative is saying that there's one more thing to get away from the the uh, guards is a, is one more uh, thing. So I'm going to say this. This is going to be a... a uh, probably a strength check for both of them to kind of crawl on their hands and knees and going through the thing and in the same respect sort of um, uh, kind of use their strength to get through the half-covered alcove that is was an entrance into some some other space. And so they're digging through the sand and also crawling through this narrowing space while the guards are behind them. And while the guards are behind them, Morgan is going to kick, kick uh, while he's down on his hands and he's crawling through, kicking them. So he's going to make one attack at disadvantage. Um, so he's going to roll uh, an unarmed attack um disadvantage he, he's getting a plus four and their ac is 15. oh seven oh it was a natural 20 so a disadvantage is um 17 plus uh four is what what is 17 plus four 21 that that definitely hits so unarmed attacks is a standard d4 um, so he does one point of damage to one of the guards, and he probably kicks him in the eye, and sand goes up into the, the, up into the guard's face, and probably reels him backwards, and narratively I'm going to say that gives him enough time to go forward and make those checks, those strength checks to see how well they can get through. And so, oh wow, poor... Poor Morgan gets a natural one on that strength check. So I'm going to I'm going to use a luck token. Oh, um, yeah, because they each get one luck. Uh, I'm going to mark those on the page here. Uh, there's no spot for the luck tokens on the sheet. So I'm going to... Um, so Tamara still has one, and Morgan had one, but now has zero is going to re-roll and must use this roll. 18, that's much better, much better. See, I'm remembering the rules and the stuff in the game now comparatively from the last campaign. So he he kicks and he struggles, but then he just, he wills himself to get through. And then with that 18 and 17, um, even though that is a minus one, this is a normal DC of 12 as per the 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 scene setting so they both succeed so they succeed in that secondary that second scene um ch uh, challenge to escape the guards so even though they ha he took a massive hit <clears throat> he's down to one hit point and he's like crawling through the sand beaten and bloody but he's used to this he is a pit fighter he fought for the various... He probably fought with those guards at some point. But again, 
being banished and being, uh, uh, being, you know, being, you know, labeled as what? Like, what is this major crime? Well, I'm going to say this, that remember this, I, there's an item that ends the scene. So I'm going to refocus the, uh, the, um, the, the, the narrative as, as this. Tamra is going to immediately cast protection from evil on Morgan, seeing Morgan's um, um, hurt sees him behind her as she's crawling forward and casts um, protection from evil. Rolls a 16 plus her 2, which is 18. Succeeds the DC of 11. Um, and um, chaotic beings have disadvantage on attacks um, and hostile spells rolls versus target. And these beings cannot uh, possess, compel, or beguile it. So... Basically, she sees him, and she's going to focus on this spell. Now, I know the focus is as long as she uh, keeps it up. So she's going to focus on this protection from evil spell and keep it up as long as she can to protect Morgan. As they're crawling through this alcove, and the sand is actually getting... Uh, cooler as they're getting into the shade and underneath this you know, crumbling building. And as I have established earlier on, that this, this town, this village of Vorn, has been built upon the, the remains of itself over and over again. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to say that the, end, the scene ends as... Tamra is you know, digging through the sand and then finds something. And what is this? And it is a, it's something small, but she gets bumped behind her as uh, Morgan you know, hits her feet and is trying to squeeze up next to her. And this is a small space, probably about five feet wide and, you know, two feet tall, you know, three feet tall as the sand is around them and they're digging through. And behind them, as they're digging through, they're digging the sand behind them too. So they're creating a kind of a barrier. So the guards have been unable to get in there. And they probably are trying to figure out a way around them, but they're moving slowly down and down and down into this darker but cooler space, and they seem to be safe for now. But she digs and she uncovers something in the sand. Now, what is this thing? So this thing is what? I could roll on a magic item thing in the table here. Um, I could roll on, ooh. The items, um, the action and theme oracle, um, but I kind of want a description of something, right? Um, so I kind of want a a descriptor. I'm going to use the Iron Sword and Star Forge guide here for the descriptor. Um, there's a bunch of abandoned or lush or rich or ruined, sacred, you know, blighted. So I'm going to use this table here. Um, or, and welcome to my brain, everybody. This is how I work. I am like a cook in a kitchen with spices everywhere, and I'm trying to figure out something to cook. And I go, oh, that might be nice. Oh, that might be nice. And that is what I'm doing right now. But I do know there is magic item ideas, right? So the attributes and and all these tables back here. And to keep it interesting, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to use these, these tables back here. And what is this item? I am 
kind of, there's lots of interesting, cool things. And because of how narratively downhill things have gotten from, from this point, they kept, especially Morgan, kept failing checks and poor um, Tamara failed to, to put those guards to sleep should have been an easy thing for her to do. I'm going to give this item. I would like to roll, like, what kind... Aha, yes, a random magic item. I'm going to roll this d6 here. And I'm going to roll the qualities. And it's personality. I'm actually going to roll a fi an actual magical item. And this is what... This is what they see. And this is what Tamara picks up in the sand. So let us roll a magic item. Oh, this is awesome. This is great. I love doing this stuff. This is the kind of stuff I don't mind sharing with everybody on how I do things. This is what drives my personal narrative forward when I play a game. Finding an interesting location, finding an interesting item... And that propels, for me, the story leagues ahead. If I was just trying to roll on a like, simple back and forth you know, combat and that kind of thing. Uh, that, was, that was wild that we ended up in this alcove. Um, and protection from evil is up. So, item ends the scene. Um, it is a magic item. It's a magic item. And what is this magic item? So let us figure that out, shall we? It is a six. It is a weapon. Ooh, okay. Qualities. Oh, here we go. Here we go. 2d6. So we got a bell curve here. So it could be have a benefit and a curse. It could just have a curse. It could just be... It can just have a benefit. Okay. Let us roll 2d6. A six is one benefit and one curse. A few magic items are conscious and have personalities that include virtues, flaws, a trait, and an alignment. Magic items with personalities can communicate te telepathically with the wielders. Do I want this to have a personality? Or rather, does this have a personality? I'm going to do 50-50 because... This is just a random magic item that narratively has no sway right now. So there's no, per there's no reason to, to give it an unlikely chance or likely chance or anything. So 50-50. Does this magic weapon that has one benefit and one curse have a personality? 73. So no, it does not. So it just has uh, properties. Um, so... It is a weapon, so page 292, 292, okay, a weapon type, oh my god, this is so cool, I get to use this weapon, or this, these tables, all right, D20, it is a 19, it's a staff, oh, this is so cool, I love magic staves, I've always loved staves, ooh, it's a staff. It's a staff. Okay. I am aware of the time. Um, my torch timer has gone out, um, which means that I do need to wrap this episode up. But I want to finish uh, rolling up this, w this weapon. All right. So the weapon type and the weapon bonus. Um, so it has one benefit and one curse. So the bonus weapon feature... Okay, cool, cool. So I will do this because it is it is magical, and it is a it is a a thing that is going to be important because of how this ends the scene. So let us roll the weapon bonus. Let's roll two d six. Ooh, an eleven. It is a plus two bonus. So it's a staff of plus two. Um, and then the feature is a d20. Let's roll the feature. Got a three. Rusted and chipped. Interesting. Okay, okay. That makes sense. 
rusted and chipped. So it doesn't look it doesn't look interesting. Um, but because the wizard is finding it, this is wild. Okay. So the benefit, the benefit, let's roll that D12, which I don't have open for some reason. Let's find a D12. Here we go. Now, this is hard for even me to see. I, I love this uh, pearlescent dice, but the gold on it, while it looks great in a vacuum, um, when I roll it, it's just hard to see sometimes. So I'm going to find a different D12. Let's roll this one. D12, this is the benefit. An eight. Regain 1d6 hit points when you slay a creature. Wow. Okay. Um, so the so the benefit, benefit, gain 1d6 when slay a creature. Okay. And then the curse... So it does have a curse. So what is this curse? Uh, three. Burn a straw dull daily or weapon temporarily loses magic. Okay. Burn a straw dull once a day or lose magic on staff okay so this is an interesting uh thing what i think i might do is is in between the this episode and next i'll actually create this item and uh have a you know, proper card for it or something like that so um yep that's so that is that so this is the final moments in this scene Tamra scoops out this staff, this kind of rusted and chipped thing. And it immediately she knows it's a magical staff. And they keep going for a little bit. And then they find a small, small uh, uh, space where there's no more sand covering. And it is just this flat stone surface. And they listen for, you know, for the guards. And everything seems quiet. And above them is this massive stone slab. So they m might be underneath a street, an another building, but they seem safe for the moment. And she casts Detect Magic to gain knowledge. She fails detect magic. So she knows that this, spe this, this item is important and is magical, but does not know anything about it. But it's like, what is going on? And she gets a, an image in her head <clears throat> of a burning effigy of a, like, of a straw doll bright in her head. And then all of a sudden the staff kind of glows. <clears throat> and then we fade to black. So I'm going to end the episode there. Um, I know it went a little long, um, but hopefully um, everything that has happened will kind of kickstart what's going to happen next. I am I am very interested to see what happens. Are they going to find a dungeon to explore? Are they going to find a safe house eventually? They have, they have successfully escaped the guards for now. So we know that they can gather their, the rest of their supplies um, safely without um, retribution. Um, but we'll see what the next scene is in the next episode. So thank you for joining me on this, this, uh, this particular uh, beginning of the adventures of... Morgan and Tamra in the Perilous Badlands, um, in the village of Vorn, which is in the outskirts of the Forsaken Dunes and the Sands of Flame. Uh, until next time, folks, see you on the flip side. Peace. <laughs>